Each year, since 2003, supporters of Phoebe, friends of the International Brigades in Ireland, have attended the annual Battle of Harama Walk and other commemorative events. We have also appreciated the opportunity to visit the Hospitalio of Tarancon and we support fully the recovery of this vital historical site. It was through here that many of the International Brigaders, wounded in the early days of their service, passed and were treated. This included, of course, Irish men, and we know volunteers such as Andrew Flanagan, County Roscommon, David Fleming, Belly Castle, Hugh Dooley, Belfast, James Campbell, Derry, John O'Shea, Waterford, and Joseph Haynes, Dublin, were all treated here. While we remember and honour the memory of all those who served, in this short contribution, we will focus on two prominent individuals, Dubliner Jack Nalty and Limerick man Frank Ryan, the acknowledged leading figure among the Irish anti-fascists. In mid-December of 1936, the first organised group of Irishmen destined for Spain and the International Brigades left Dublin. At the quayside, Frank Ryan stated their mission as a demonstration of the sympathy of revolutionary Ireland against international fascism. It's also a reply to the intervention of Irish fascism in the war against the Spanish Republic, which, if unchallenged, would remain a disgrace on our people. We want to show that there is a close bond between the democracies of Ireland and Spain. Our fight is the fight of the Spanish people, as it is of all peoples who are victims of tyranny. Some within the ranks of the earliest volunteers, such as Kit Conway, Tommy Wood and Dinny Cody, would be dead within weeks, and most would be wounded at least once during their service. It was as early as the 28th of December when Jack Nalty was injured. He had fought in Ireland's War of Independence and Ireland's Civil War. He was a member of the Republican Congress and the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And he had been jailed for both his political and trade union activity in Ireland. The Spanish baptism of fire came quickly and as the brigaders advanced on Via del Rio, fellow Dubliner Donal O'Reilly witnessed his companion being struck. Kit Conway spreads us out. Duff, Nalty and myself are on the edge of the road. We realise we are now fighting a rearguard action. Cummins and Goff are wounded and move back. Jack Nalty is hit. I won't look. Paddy Duff attends him. I glance and see both sides of Jack's chest are hit. I feel I must cry or act a pig so I go back to the gun for relief. It's clear Jack is badly hit. I think he's finished. We advise Jack to start making his own way back. We'll cover the ground later, perhaps. Jack crawls away. Frank Ryan, in a report sent a few weeks later, while he himself was recovering from wounds, commented, Jack Nalty was caught in machine gun fire. He had three bullets in his chest and his right arm was broken. He picked up his rifle and slung it on the good shoulder, caught up the broken arm and walked three kilometres to the field hospital. Others need stretchers more, he said. Of course, a man with such an iron constitution is alive and on the mend today. Jack spent three months in hospital. He returned to Ireland where he played a prominent role in propaganda work and trying to rally support for the Spanish Republic. He returned to the battlefield in 1938 and died at the Battle of the Ebro on the International Brigade's final day of combat, 23rd of September 1938. In a letter sent to Dublin less than a month before his death, he commented, It's marvellous what men can endure in support of an ideal. Frank Rahan is the name most prominently associated with the Irish contribution to the International Brigades. One of the most prominent figures in Irish republicanism in the 1920s and 30s, alongside Peter O'Donnell and George Gilmore, he was a driving force behind the Republican Congress, which led the way in marrying the forces of social change, republicanism and anti-fascism. While recognised for his organisational and propaganda skills, he was also a fearless man of action, and his charisma and sheer determination 
were vital in rallying disorganised and demoralised brigaders at a key moment during the Battle of Harama. Here is an extract from his own account. Dispirited by heavy casualties, by defeat, by lack of food, worn out by three days of gruelling fighting, our men appeared to have reached the end of their resistance. Some were still straggling down the slopes from what had been up to an hour ago, the front line. And now there was no line. Nothing between the Madrid road and the fascists but disorganised groups of weary, war-wracked men. After three days of terrific struggle, the superior numbers, the superior armament of the fascists had routed them. All as they came back had similar stories to tell, of comrades dead, of conditions that were more than flesh and blood could stand, of weariness they found hard to resist. There was no time to sort them into units. I noted with satisfaction that some had brought down spur rifles. I found my eyes straying always to the hills we had vacated. I hitched a rifle to my shoulder. They stumbled to their feet. No time for barrack square drill. One line of four, fall in behind us. A few were still on the grass bank beside the road, adjusting helmets and rifles. Hurry up, came the cry from the ranks. Up the road towards the cookhouse, I saw Jack Cunningham assembling another crowd. We hurried up, joined forces. Together, we too marched at the head. Whatever popular writers may say, neither your Briton nor your Irishman is an exuberant type. Demonstrativeness is not his dominating trait. The crowd behind us was marching silently. The thoughts in their minds could not be inspiring ones. I remembered a trick of the old days when we were holding band demonstrations. I jerked my head back. Sing up, ye sons of guns. Quaveringly at first, then more lustily, then in one resounding chant, the song rose from the ranks. Bent heads straightened. Tired legs thumped sturdily. What had been a routed rabble marched to battle again as proudly as they had done three days before. And the valley resounded to their singing. Then comrades come rally and the last fight let us face. The internationale unites the human race. On we marched, back up the road, nearer and nearer to the front. Stragglers, still in retreat, down the slopes, stopped in amazement, changed direction and ran to join us. Men, lying exhausted on the roadside, jumped up, cheered and joined the ranks. I looked back. Beneath the forest of upraised fists, what a strange band. Unshaven, unkempt, bloodstained, grimy, but full of fight, again marching on the road back. It was following this rallying of the troops that Ryan would be injured and spend some time in Tarancon Hospital. He would continue to work with International Brigade headquarters. While he was considering a propaganda tour to rally support for the Spanish Republican cause amongst Irish Americans, the deteriorating military situation saw him return to the front line. He had edited the Book of the 15th Brigade, and on the very day it was published in March 1938, he was captured by Italian fascist troops at Calacete. Nalti and Ryan are just two examples of the heroic and determined anti-fascists who left Ireland to join comrades from across the globe in the defence of the Spanish Republic against fascist barbarism. Like many who, at that time, were vilified in their home country for this stance, the horrors which engulfed Europe soon afterwards proved that they were on the correct side of history. We wish we could commemorate them together again this year with our friends from Spain and internationally, but circumstances do not allow for this. Instead, until we can travel again, and in the words of the great Christy Moore, let us all remember them tonight. Viva la República.